Um, well, cool. Um, if you're ready to get started, I'm ready. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm ready to roll. Okay, Absolutely. cool, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Eric. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's an honor to get to be on here. Yeah. Um, man, I really enjoyed your the book, Raising Men, man. It was really cool. Oh, good, good. Glad you like it. Yeah, I've been yeah. getting uh, more and more good uh, different reviews and emails from people, so it's fun to watch the responses grow in quantity and quality, so I've been I enjoying bet. that. I bet. Um, give it, for people that don't know you, can you give just a, a brief background of kind of your history in, in the SEALs and, and who are you? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, ah, boy, probably, I mean, really the <laughs> best when I go intro, it, I mean, it's got to go a little deeper than that. So anyone who's read the book or knows anything I write or read about, I'll almost always talk about about 15 years old when my dad got sick. That's when I started looking for that, you know, too young to be without a dad, just old enough to recognize that I needed one. This leads to my SEAL background. And it's just, I feel like it's all one story. Definitely, yeah. Um, dove in, I'm giving you the very abbreviated version, but, you know, dove in, personal development, self-help books, tapes, anywhere I could find, I was looking to fill that gap, realized that most of it was bullshit. None of it really worked or did anything. Plus, I was young. So I did the natural thing. I went in the Navy and joined the SEAL teams because I thought, man, okay, whatever those guys got going on, that's something I can start building my life from. So that drove me into the Navy. But I had a little color vision issue, so it took me a good five years before I got to SEAL training. So I was a, a, a medic, what they call a corpsman okay. in the Navy. I actually turned 18 in boot camp, so I went in pretty young, um, became a Marine reconnaissance corpsman, which was the Marines version of special operations then. Uh, and then finally passed that color vision test through practice and prayer and uh, went to SEAL training, quit SEAL training because I was a young parent, had two kids already. And I thought, ah, oh, man, somebody talked me out of it. They're like, hey, you got to go make the money, be safe, live a normal life. And I was like, geez, you're right. So I, I'd already <laughs> I been in the Navy five years. I don't remember years. this being in the book. Sorry to interrupt. I don't remember being that, that part being in the book. I you know, it's so weird. It's uh, I have a hard time sometimes remembering where I wrote something, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that is in the book. I know I've shot some videos and I've talked about it a little bit, especially with dads and parents, because so many guys give up their dreams because of their kids. Yes, yes. Um, and they think they need to. They think there's some sort of compromise that they have to make or some sort of sacrifice, which we'll, we'll get into later when we talk about the ebook I just released. But. Um, I did it and it wasn't, I mean, almost instantaneous. I got out of the Navy and I was regret just hit me immediately. And then, and what really hit me is like, God bless the first thing I'm doing as a father, as a parent is I'm demonstrating to my kids how giving up on your dreams, uh, is the way to go. And I, I was, you know, young. I mean, I turned, you know, 18, 19, 21, like 22. I mean, very young. Oh, wow. And I had the wisdom at the time to be like, no, I can't start life this way. So I actually went back in the Navy prayer and practice past the color vision test again. Um, so I was never supposed to go to SEAL training. So twice I went and uh, then I graduated, uh, deployed almost immediately, came back. September 11th happened. I was on oh, post-deployment wow. leave, getting ready to get out of the Navy to pursue my dream of going into law enforcement like my father. Um, and they said, hey, if you re-enlist, we'll send you to Afghanistan. Long story short, I, I fell for that trick. <laughs> and I ended up being a sniper instructor when I came back, which I spent five of my 10 years, um, which is a significant part of the story because usually you spend a couple, three years as an instructor. But I dove so deep into human performance and coaching and training that the Navy thought it better to keep me and a guy named Brandon Webb, who was my best friend and, and uh, another instructor there, thought it best to keep us there. Um, and that's where I got so steep in human performance and training of which in 2008 I brought out to the the quote unquote real world and have been doing that ever since. Wow. Um, yeah, I think you touched, well, you touched on a lot of stuff there, but giving up your dreams for that, how someone was able to convince you because you were pretty impressionable. You said you were what, 21 at that point, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I was five years into 18. Yeah. Like 22, I think yeah. by the time I got out. Yeah. And it's just, it's amazing how easy it is for, like other people and what other people think that you should do to become, wow, you know, maybe that, that is what I should do, or that is how I feel. But you know, deep down that you, you really don't, but somehow everyone's influence conspires against you and then makes you believe that it was your idea. Like, yeah, I should get a safe job. They're right. They're right. Yeah. It's uh you know, it's herd mentality, right? And yeah, yeah. It, 
it is very difficult to go against the herd. <clears throat> and I mean that like it really, really is. There are all these woolly, fuzzy sheep walking the opposite direction. And it's like they push on you and their wool is so comfortable and warm. And you just all of a sudden get caught up and float with them you know, <laughs> and, and to dig your to dig your feet into the dirt and be like, no, you know, you hit all the friction. Yeah. You know, all the wool keeps going by you, then it's hot and uncomfortable, and you're like, all right, you know, screw this. And it takes a few of those, I've found a few of those iterations before you're like, wait a minute, I'm not even supposed to be in here with the sheep. I'm the shepherd or the farmer. Like, I'm. that's why this keeps happening to me. So that was the first part of my life, you know, and it took me, you know, years after to figure that out. I got to get away from the sheep. I, I love them. Uh, yeah, they're all over the place, right? That's humans. That's people. Most of them are kind of a sheepish mentality. But I, I love them. Um, but it's not my job to be with them. It's my job to care for them. It's a different space. Wow, unbelievable. I, I've never heard that metaphor before, but that's I really like that a lot. What do you use? Um, I mean, now you've probably been so far on your own path, it doesn't matter. But at the beginning, kind of like, what would you suggest for people to, <clears throat> um, like, every day – combat against that herd mentality because you know you're like you're right it's, it's all around us right yeah absolutely and and you know that when you said that you've been so far down your own path by now it doesn't matter and i actually would say it absolutely does matter oh okay. uh and it's crazy it's because there's a con it's this is a scientific term it's called third order co-ontogenic structural coupling which means when your mama said, if your friends jump off a cliff, would you do it also? The answer is absolutely yes, mom. If my friends kept jumping off the cliff, eventually I would too. And what I'm saying is we couple with our environment. So even if you pull yourself out of the the, 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 the space, the matrix, you're still – and don't watch TV or new. You know what I'm saying? You totally seclude yourself, but you're talking to other human beings who they're spending their day watching TV, listening to Facebook news and all that mm. crap out there. Their opinions are influenced, so you swim in this environment like that. So the same answer that applies to me every single day applies to anybody who is still in that kind of herd mentality is to be around a powerful group and intentionally – train and do life with them. Just like if you were a martial artist and you wanted to become a black, I do jujitsu, right? If you want to be a black belt in jujitsu, you can't just listen to audio books and, and have a, a 50 book list of books to read during the year. Those are good things. Those are useful. They're part of the puzzle, but you got to have a team and someone to lead you and train all the time, every day. Otherwise we just fall back on into the herd and we get sucked back in. There's no way out of it. It's how we go. Wow. So you, you still develop that every day you wake up with that same mentality and like, I'm going to go against the sheep again today. And then the next day you wake up and do the same again. Yeah, it's not, uh, I'm not organized around, uh, going against them. Um, it just, the contrarian kind of life I live, um, that's just, that's how it ends up needing to be. Not because I want to be opposite of them or want to be different. Sure, it just yeah, turns yeah. out most people are heading towards the slaughter um, so I can't be there because I can't help lead them out of it. Uh, and that requires a daily focus. Uh, but my focus isn't on not doing that. My focus is on the vision. I study every day. I write. I read. I surround myself. So that way I it's, it's not to avoid the sheep. It's to stay on my path. Does that make – it's just a yeah, subtle totally. difference. Well, but I it's mean, a, it's, I mean that it's kind of just like when you say like instead of going around saying I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. You just say I want that, I want that, I want that instead. Yeah, it's it's the shift between being a victim and being the hero in your yes. own life, um, and that's a product of having a vision, you know, bigger than yourself. And what is your vision right now specifically? So, the best I can describe it is, I'm working to redefine what a hero is in today's culture. Awesome. And. That's redefining manhood. That's not accepting cultural common sense. That's not accepting the things – because I'm a man. If it's a woman, it's womanhood, right? Uh -huh. uh, there's no difference between the two. It's just a different way you speak to it. Mm -hmm. Not accepting the, the stale, antiquated, uh, broken operating systems that were passed down from our fathers and grandfathers. Not because they were doing anything wrong, but the world and the environment changed so quickly with technology. And we're in such a different space now. That stuff just doesn't work anymore. So that's what I'm after. My my vision, my mission in life is to redefine that and then lead other men to be the hero in their own life so that they can be the hero in the lives of others. Beautiful. What do you mean um what has been broken between then and now and what in, in what way are you trying to bring out the kind of new version? You know, in its simplest form, I would say like manhood and that cultural role, and I'll collapse manhood and heroism together for the, the sake of what we're talking about. 
<clears throat> but for decades, if not longer, um, our culture and society moved along at about the same pace as our biology and our common sense and, you know, the way our fathers and grandfathers did things. Just, you know, boom, work, go to school, work hard, retire with a pension. That lasted for a long time. Yeah. And that has you in a certain set of practices. And not that I have anything against doing your own gardening and being your own mechanic and all those things that people quote unquote would say are manly, um, being aggressive, uh, you know, different things like that. They don't necessarily work so well now because we're now in a hyper competitive environment. We have way as a parent, this is the first gen we're the first generation of parents to have to raise raise kids with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Those things have nasty things coming down inside of them. Um, how many likes kids get on their picture affects their self confidence. Excuse everything. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, we're in a much more complex and dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. We can't just hit it hard at the old factory, come home, pull up our black socks, kick it on the recliner and watch cops on TV anymore. We got to be ready to engage with the kids. And it used to be just fine. Make the money, come home. Mama had it all handled. Wasn't too much we needed to do besides be there and provide love and support. But now we got to be in these conversations. We got to be in these narratives. I got to yeah. hear about this crap they're doing and talking about at school so I can unwind my kids and, and everybody around me. Make, does that make sense what I'm saying? It's like a more complex environment. Yeah, definitely. How would yeah. you how would you say that like if a um a guy listening, you know, how would what are some kind of tips or advice that you have acquired throughout your Navy SEAL training for them to um for them to deal with this new environment? So there you know, there's this I'm gonna try to pull up this quote while we're talking, but I can do like n more. I can only do a half a thing at a time, but I'm going to try it oh, here. No worries, man. So, and I'm going to answer the question because this quote is just super relevant. Um, the quote comes from a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. And he says this, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. But hold that quote. Now, okay. as a sniper instructor, when I'm teaching students, there's a whole story here, but there are so many fundamental principles going on that are going to affect their ability to hit their target. Like a golfer, there is 150 things that they need to have dialed in for their swing to be right. Kind of the same idea. Yeah. Um, they can't hold that much at once. So what I would do is like, all right, trust me guys i'm going to give you the tactics the things to do you just the tips the tricks just do this shot sheet you go down this list and do it and as you're doing it i'm going to backfill and teach you the fundamentals teach you all the principles things like the spin of the earth hell what you ate for breakfast your mental mindset your game that's going on in your mind your subconscious your self image the the parallax and the scope your body position your trigger squeeze humidity all mm -hmm. i can go on forever it, it would just overwhelm you um, same thing in life. Like, all right, life is more complica complicated than the news or the media or marketing would like to have us think because if we understood the complexity of it, we'd turn off the TV and the news and the radio and get to work and study all the time. And that's just not, <laughs> you don't sell commercials that way. It's just not going to go down you don't, that way. I've we never said you never, you never sell stuff with a bunch of satisfied people that are doing stuff with their life, you know? Oh uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Buy yeah, absolutely. It never goes down that yeah. way. So what I'm, what I would say to people is embrace the complexity. Understand that life is complex. There's a lot to it. I mean, this is our whole lives here. But understand that there is simplicity on the other side. Like, a, again, a martial artist, <coughs> once he's a black belt, he's not thinking about all the little minutia, all the movements, all the little things. Just like a professional golfer, they're not thinking about all those things. So things have gotten very simple for them, but, they're on, but they've already passed through it. They've already learned the thousand things they needed to and mastered them. So now they're thinking about the three or four or five fundamental things. And that's what I would suggest for everybody. Okay. And to just walk around embracing the fact that it's complicated and kind of difficult for everybody and you just got to embrace it. Yeah, and go through it. And, mm -hmm. and it does because it becomes simple on the other side. But recognize also that there are people out there in organizations, and I'm not trying to go conspiracy theory, but it is in their best interest that you're walking around as a simpleton. They, you know, they actually have people thinking saving 5% of their income is a good thing, like a goal. And I'm a pretty positive guy, but if the glass 
is 95% empty. I'm not thinking it's half full. I'm thinking, shit, dude, where'd all my water go? I'm missing. <laughs> That's how they have us thinking. Yeah, you know what's interesting too is how you said, I'm not trying to sound conspiracy theory sounding, as in like even just the fact of mentioning that there might be some type of mind control going on through obviously the media and the corporations and what they want us to think is like, uh oh, you know, you might sound crazy, but it's so obvious, you know? It- it, you, you know, if you go back, again, let's bring, if you bring, go through the complexity of all and bring it down to the fundamentals, uh, you know, if you watch news or read news, wherever you're consuming it, 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 if it's, you know, free news stuff coming at you, you got to understand what their job is. The news's job is not to give you information and knowledge. It's to provide sales for the commercials that are coming up next. And it, my thing is it's okay. Some people get all pissed when they realize that. I'm like, no, that's capitalism, man. That's marketing. That's just how it works. And it's okay as long as you're in the know. It really sucks that's exactly, if you're not. Yes, that's yeah. exactly right. I was just thinking about this the other night, man, because I heard um, uh, Joe Rogan talking kind of about the same subject on his podcast. And I was watching the news later, and I thought, oh, my God, they are, they're like attention uh, suckers. Like they're just yes. – you are – your attention is like, I don't know if you'd call it an energy or a currency or something, but that attention is what they're trying to extract and then somehow transmute it into money for the corporations, right? Oh, yeah. That's what they sell. They sell, I think uh, Gary crazy. Vaynerchuk says it best. He talks about they sell uh, attention. They, yeah. they, they sell people's attention to their um, advertisers, which, which is fantastic. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work. Exactly, yeah. It, it's how human beings survive, right? It's a principle called marginal utility. We notice things that stand out, and that's why these things have to be flavorful and interesting and everything like that. Again, uh, super cool stuff as long as you're aware of it. And if you're not, you can very well go your lifetime saving 5% and become 65 years old and go, oh, uh-oh, I got to hit Walmart <laughs> now and start greeting people, which is okay too, but you yeah. might not want to do it. You might Your legs might hurt. Yeah, yeah man, I think that it's... Uh... I think what you said about how being in the know is so important because you, you just, yeah, you gotta be aware of it. Cause in the end, it's kind of like this big game, this big facade everyone's playing. And if you realize it and just recognize it, then it's a lot easier to be like, oh, okay, I see that. I, I can turn off the news. You know, I don't have to fall for all the crap because I recognize that it's crap. Oh but, yeah. You, I, I, you, you know, the news when they're like predator in your neighborhood, stalking your windows and stealing your children yeah. more at, more at 11, I'm like, what? If they really cared about me, they would just put the guy's picture up and GPS locate him. They wouldn't make me wait till 11. Why do they want me to wait and stay tuned? It's not because they want to have saved me from the stalker, the dude jumping yes. in our windows, stealing our babies. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Which is okay. Yeah. Again, I've got no problem with it because I, I feel like I'm more in the know than I'm not. And I also recognize that there's a whole bunch I don't know they're getting me on. Mm -hmm. Um uh, that's happening too, but I'm working to unravel that every day. <laughs> nice. Um, so let's go back to like, I mean, you, you wrote this book called Raising Men. Um, and why did you decide now to kind of, I know that there's so many, all these complex things we talked about for masculinity and stuff, but for raising your, your boys in this environment. Um, and I know you went through some stuff of like, how dumping, I love how you say like dumping beer and watching TV is not going to fulfill your desires. It's just not, you know, and there's so many distractions now, you're right, that take away from men or women. But, you know, you talked about men in this going after like those difficult and challenging things when instead now you can sit home and you can jack off to porn and go on Instagram and FaceTime with somebody and watch, you know, play a video game and be like, oh, I, I pretty much clocked off all the stuff for being a man today. I was aggressive on Halo and talked, you know, <laughs> jacked off to the girl and like your mind yeah. thinks you did it all, but you didn't do shit. You stayed in your apartment, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so is that kind of why you went through this process now, seeing everything that you're seeing and raising your boys? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have actually one boy, three girls, and my dog is a girl too. Um, so, <laughs> um, but the reason, the raising men, the reason why I was focused with at him with him because I'm a man also and I and everything I do and right I'm not one of those guys like hey look at me like I'm doing it because I need it um and it and it what it is it's part of what I was talking about the complexities um and the access to information and and the power that's at our fingertips right and it's the old spider-man thing with great power comes great responsibility and you can choose to use that power 
to, you know, scratch one out or play a video game or do whatever you're doing, which is really just a, an abuse or waste of power. Or you can access this amazing online internet and access any piece of knowledge or information that you need and take it and do something with it. And I guess here's my thing is I don't believe that I was, and I don't think anybody was, but I'll just speak for myself. I don't believe that I was put on this earth just to entertain myself and be okay. Right? So there are people suffering. There are people in human trafficking situations. There's people who straight can't eat today who are going to die of some sort of wacky disease that we could cure at CVS with, you know, 250 in our pocket. Yeah. There are so many things to do on this earth and on this planet. And I don't believe that our time's up once we cook off here. I think the only thing coming with us are other people. So when I'm on the other side, I expect to answer to other people on the planet who are hurting and needed my help. And I don't want them to be like, hey, dude, you really spent your time online chatting on Facebook, playing Candy Crush and Halo and all that stuff when I was over here starving? I, I, I want to, you know, no. I want to be like, no. I was helping empower people so they can get their life handled so that they can redeploy their time and resources and capacity to the other parts of the world and the other people on the planet that needed help. So that that's what drove it all. I want to create more effective and efficient people, not so that they can be like, successful, so to speak, in, in the in conventional terms, but so that they can impact the world and impact other people, which when you work with people who have already got money handled, that is always where they want to go. Yes. Yeah. That's right? a fantastic point. Yeah. Yep. That's where, that's where we all, it's in our human nature to want to be with and help other people. It's inside of us. It'll mess us up if we don't deal with it to some yeah. level. But every time I'm with someone who is truly successful, financially speaking, and they're got it handled, the, their next vision is always, who am I going to help? Who am I going to impact? That's where we all want to head. That's, I want to get their people there faster. Excellent. And I think what happens is if you don't get to that point or if you trick yourself into thinking, well, I should just buy more stuff, buy more stuff, you're going to implode or you're going to be miserable. I mean, I just don't think there's another option. No, it, it doesn't work. It's just like, you know, you know, we're hunters, we're fighters. There's certain kind of internal things that we are we are bred for and built for and helping other people and doing things like that is part of it. And every time we try to shortchange it. So my next book, I wrote an ebook called Habits of Heroes. I probably should have named it something different, but it's four mistakes men make and how to avoid them. Uh, but the big, the bigger book that has the same title, which now I'm going to have to deal with what I, the mess I created there, but <laughs> that the entire book is about just that thing. It's about understanding how we are built and designed and there's, there's a story here. I'm, I was listening to an audio book and I was just doing a dog demonstration. I use attack dogs. I bring them to corporations and show them how behavior change works, right? Oh, cool. And on this audio book, the, the lady started to describe this bipolar bear. She's like, yeah, you take this thing out of 50,000 acres of hunting and put it into a zoo. They get this thing called zoocosis where they do this self-mutilating behavior. And yeah, they you talked about that in the book too. Yeah, pacing, just pacing, pacing. Yeah, pacing back and forth. Yeah. I like started to cry when I read this because I'm like, oh my God, that's me. It, my self mutilating behavior, what you name it, right? Self medication, drugs, alcohol, TV. What I mean, we all do it to ourselves. But the problem is, those things aren't they're they aren't going to do it. They're like little temporary patches mm -hmm. for the disease, and the diseases that we're not being our true selves, and that's eating people up. And so the bigger book will be more about that. And it'll be accessing people who haven't gotten confined into offices and stuff like that. And what are they doing to stay he happy, healthy, and wise, et cetera. Yeah, that's awesome. The self-medication is, oh man, I think that's the biggest, because the, there's so much of it now. Before you could, like if you're talking about like, uh, you know, our parents' generation, it was booze, you know, you could probably go to a, a strip club, a gentleman's club. But my God, now we carry self-medication in our pockets. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is with us all the time. And, and the behavior science behind, they call it it's positive reinforcement, schedule reinforcement, and ratio reinforcement. It mm. all goes into the texting and beeps and triggers. It, it triggers our biology just like you would train a dolphin. It's, it's quite amazing. Right, that you but, get a dopamine response, right? Yes, it's triggering. You got it. Dopamine release, these little devices in our pocket will fire you. They'll get you all the time. And, and when we think of self-medication, it's not just – booze, beer, and stuff like that. You were talking about it with the Gentleman's Club and different things like that. It could be incessive watching of YouTube video. I know so many people like, oh yeah, I, I don't sleep well as so I'm watching YouTube videos. <laughs> I've, I've gone down the rabbit hole a couple times late at night. Oh, yeah. it, 
<laughs> oh yeah, these Overlander videos. I have a four wheel drive truck and I keep it always ready to go. And I obsess. I'm like, right, am I gonna get a camper? Am I gonna get a sports mobile van? Am I gonna get <laughs> Overland my truck? And I'm self medicating. What's weird is I went snowboarding with my son, and then shortly after, I did some snowboarding and some little tiny uh, uh, blade skiing with my daughters. And it'd been a while uh, since I'd been out in the snow, and I just remember afterwards, I was like, oh my gosh, okay, where am I going next week? Where am I going this weekend? I had come off the self-medication of maybe watching these videos or something like that, and into the, I got the real thing. I'm like, oh, there's the real medicine. Um, which is why, like the the group of men I'm working with this year, I'm having, I'll do like three excursions, kind of sea, air, land, the seal thing, right and on. a lot of people are like, oh, that's fun, rah rah, you know, uh, it's like a team building event. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what this is. That's this is restoking a certain fire to get you hooked on the real stuff, uh, rather than the substitute bull crap that we get on. Yes, I love that, and that's what. God, we're in such a weird place now with the the substitute stuff because the like the internet you're right gives you substitute everything substitute sex substitute excitement substitute knowledge substitute action and and you can get wrapped up in thinking that you are actually doing it but you're like i said you're not doing actually anything it yeah. tricks you all the time it's such a weird place we're at right now <laughs> yeah it's not the it's just not the real thing um it's it's not going to work. It's going to leave you, it's going to leave you short. Uh, yeah. you're not, it has you thinking you're taking your chemo, your, your medicine, but you're not, that's the, that's the, what makes it dangerous. That's where the, that's where I do get a little fired up. Uh, because when people access that they're, they're subsiding some symptoms and they think they're doing what they need to, mm -hmm. but that's why happiness is down and depression is up because it's not going to work everybody it's just not going to fly it's right yeah is that kind of like uh i know you talked about action versus movement sure in your book um is that kind of yeah. what it is like movement you think you're doing it but you're really not actions actually going out there and doing something it is uh it, it, yeah actually it is it's a different context so when i talk action versus movement i'm talking about okay, I have a vision and I now have a set of strategies and then a set of tactics and what I'm doing is that action to reach that vision as opposed to just running around being busy. Uh, but it would be the same thing if we think we're doing something to care for this internal need we have, but it's bankrupt, then we are just moving and we're not getting anywhere. We're not, again, we're not curing the disease. We're right. just temporarily treating the symptoms and man, there's some nasty stuff out there. Yeah. <sighs> you know, even... Not, medication and not and sometimes people need medicine but but the side effects and it just does not it's not for most people what most people need to do is get their ass together in a brotherhood get out and about several times a year and live the life for which they were bred for they're they're stamped it was stamped into them use it what's the organization that you just that you mentioned that you run that take guys out what's that called uh well there isn't no, I mean, I call it a strategic training group. Oh, um, that was the, okay. Yeah. There's no like organization name for organizational name for it. It was a pivot I made. I did this, uh, at the end of last year, I was doing kind of a marketing project where I was reached calling people, my readers and saying, Hey, what had you find me? What were you looking for? So I was actually talking to people because as a writer, you can connect with hundreds of thousands of people, <clears throat> but it gets really hard to connect with like a hundred <laughs> because yeah writing's hard work and you hole up in it sometimes. So I'd gotten myself secluded. Uh, but as I was talking with them, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is why my writing so far, why I've been able to be successful is not because I'm any kind of poetic writer, but because I'm sharing stories about this kind of thing, conversations with people where I'm actually having them perform way beyond their perceived limits and knocking them out of their rut and their routine. And it just hit me. I'm like, I'm not, I not doing this anymore. I next year, 2000, this was last year, 2017, I'm going to dump my corporate clients, which is like less personal and a different kind of, it's just a different space. Uh -huh. And I'm going to bring, take on work with seven men and I'm going to hand select each guy. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah. And that's what this is. So I call it strategic training group. I just launched it publicly maybe a week and a half ago or so. Awesome. So that's what I'm actively doing. I spend most of my day right now interviewing and studying men who apply. So I can I want to make sure anyone in this group is surrounded by six other dudes that they're like, wow, these are some amazing guys because yeah. that whole thing, that environment. Yeah. I want to separate them from the herd and ha and produce leaders. So <clears throat> that's 
the core of what I'm up to. I, everything we just, we've been talking about, I'm producing an environment to make that exist for people, to include myself. Awesome. And are, are you going to be making videos or be putting this up as another book? Or where can like are people going to be able to see this almost <laughs> as a case study and, and see what to learn from it? Or yeah, so the the place to go is my website ericdavis215.com, which I'm sure we'll hit later. Um, but the ebook, it's called Habits of Heroes. It's oh, right that's on my. It's going to be included. Okay. St- I would have anyone start because to follow, no matter what they want to do, start there. I, there's still four spots open, so some people might be like, "I'm in this. I want to get in this thing," and you'll the book will lead them to it. But if they don't become part of it, uh, the commitment of the group is the hero in our own lives so that we can be the hero in the lives of others. So I'll leave a trail on the website of all the lessons learned, um, all the things we're doing. And then this book habits of heroes, probably in a month or two, I'll start the actual drafting and writing of it. And I'll be using our experiences, not like specific stories or all like we're, you know, I'm using people's names and stuff, but I'm going to be summarizing the experiences of the group and processing them in a way into, and putting it inside of my own story with the heroes that I've met throughout my life and deliver it as a final product so that people can begin their journey. And of course the journey only can begin with the book. It can never finish because now they got to get out and get some and get a yeah. pe- you know, they got to go on their yeah. journey as well. I think that is badass, man. I think that it comes at a perfect time too, because it takes someone, you know, someone badass like you saying, Hey, this is kind of, some of the things that you should do or, or just kind of uh, setting the guidelines, but in a way that, like you said, that isn't this like macho aggro bro, you know, like, oh, just fucking beat people up, man. Like fuck those <laughs> yeah. guys. You know what I mean? Because you, you do see those two sides. It's, it's in my mind, it's either new age, lovey dovey. Um, like, Hey, let's love the, you know, love the world, you know, just kind of that classic example in my head. And then it's like the, the douchey bro guy beating everybody up is like these two opposites of the spectrum. So I think it's super important and cool when you get a, uh, a certified badass, like a Navy seal to be like, Hey, this is kind of what has worked for me. And I'm doing it in this manner in this very like respectful and loving manner, but like tough love. I think that that's extremely important right now. I, I appreciate that. And it's not, you know, I've had people watch me like train kids swimming or whatever, and they tell me like, "My God, I'm I'm surprised how kind and patient you are." And and I and I and I like, "What What do you mean? Why Why does that surprise you?" They're like, "Oh, because you're a seal, etc." And yeah. I'm like, "Oh, I get it." I go, "Yeah, we don't. There's no one of the beauties about being a seal is you do end up with a pretty good level of confidence." And I explained to him like, you know, there's I got nothing. I got no need to, you know, be that macho type guy. That's it. If I'm training somebody typically that's not what they need. (laughs) There are four quadrants of behavior and what they need is someone to dance in all four of those, giving the person what they need to take the next step to get to the next truth. So it's about being effective, not fitting in this kind of image and power is different. So I had a stalker and I know kidding have 360 degree surveillance clearly can defend my household and myself with weapons. And I mean, I feel very (laughs) comfortable with that. Yeah. No, behind me, there was an attack Belgian Malmois literally sitting right next to me who's fully trained to tear someone up if need be, but I couldn't do anything. And everyone's like, God, what are you doing, man? You're a SEAL. Why don't you kick his ass? I'm like, well, let me explain why I don't. Because I can't. <laughs> you can't You can't just go haul off and whoop somebody's ass nowadays because they're not, now I'm in a lawsuit. Now I'm not writing. Now I'm not at work. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of things like that. I, I'm not t- if, of course, he attacked. I can defend myself, but I can only defend myself as amount as he can deserve because the judge surely would be like, Mr. Davis, why did you injure this man? You clearly could have just stopped. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. What was very interesting to me, I had to explain this to my son. I go, son, understand power. Physical power is very limited, it's very small, and it's not nearly as important as personal power, or in this case, it was financial power. So I had to approach this situation within the law. I had to hire lawyers, I had to put up additional security cameras. It was my ability to produce uh, what, I, what people would consider a high enough income so that I had the capacity to do stuff like that. It's so much more, yeah, you gotta be able to defend yourself, you gotta be able to take care of business if someone attacks you and your family, but more likely than not, your ability to protect your family is not going to come from your 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 right your right hook. It's probably going to come from your checkbook, actually. Well, that rhymes a little bit, but you know what I'm yeah. saying. Power is different than men think about. 
Yeah, that's um, I, I, what it is. I think is what you, you talked about first is like the self confidence thing. You don't have, you have nothing to prove, so it's like let's be let's use my brain in this situation instead of, like you said, my right hook. Yeah, it, it is. It comes from confidence because everyone's saying that to me. I'm like, oh, you know what? I, it's not that I'm afraid to fight because I feel comfortable fighting. And, and I, you know, and I'm like, me of all people, I grew up with red hair and freckles. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. The first time a bully, because a stalker is a bully, right? Which is the same thing as a terrorist for all those bully kids at school. And I'm like, the first time I can dispatch somebody, I can whoop someone's ass. I'm like, now I can't do it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. The red hair freckle face <laughs> kid that grew up in middle school. I'm like, this is a bummer, but I don't care anymore. Yeah. That's the key. That's the key. You don't have a chip on your shoulder. Cause I think, and, and the herd mentality is to hey, go kick his ass, bro. It's a stalker. Like, you know, and, uh, yeah. and if you don't have something to prove, I know that if I was out and about and like someone said something, I'd be like, well, I've got to, I got to fucking defend my woman and like, yeah, let's do this, you know, but that's just because I'd be trying to prove something, you know, or to prove mm -hmm. that I'm somebody, you know? Yeah. It usually doesn't support the mission, but it's the same thing in the world. I mean, it's insane that we're still killing other, each other on human beings on this planet. Like violence never supports the mission, but it's tough to do when there's idiots. Some, some people are so stupid that you're left with no choice, but to pop yeah. them. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, Talk to me about excuses, because um, I know that that's a huge thing in a lot of people's <laughs> lives, and I know you talked about it um, in your book a lot, owning up to your mistakes and, and making excuses to yourself. Do you have any excuses that you tell yourself still currently? Uh, yeah, every day. I can grab my wife if you want and have her get on the horn, and we can <laughs> we can list them out, uh, You know, which I think is important to be like, uh, as much as I work... Uh, I, I think excuses are is kind of like sin for the for the the, the spiritual people out there. The, they're one of those things that once you start getting rid of them, you'll just keep finding more. The, the nice thing is, is pretty. You know, one day you're making excuses for being a total douche, and then you know you evolve into that situation. Then you realize, okay, now the excuses I'm making are something smaller and not as impactful for life. But uh, yeah, I do. And, you know, I always differentiate excuse, excuses and reasons. So an excuse is something that I, if somebody's like, I'm not, like when I work with these dudes and they're trying to get somewhere, I'm always looking for the action. Like, all right, what's the thing, what's the thing, the next step, the thing you need to be in action, the thing to do and what's in your way. And I can tell their excuses. If, if, if they're putting excuses in their way, I can remove the excuse and they still won't move. Make sense? They're mm -hmm. they're still will stay put because now it's there's something else holding them back. Now a reason, right. hmm. like okay, yeah, I need to I need to double my income so I can bring my wife home from work so that we can have a passionate relationship so I'm not getting my ass kicked left and right by having family and work. And the reason I don't do that is because I I don't make enough money. I'm like okay, so if we can produce a situation, put other people around you, get some situational awareness, some unconventional knowledge, have a different way to think about money where you can start increasing your value, would that work? And they're like, yes. And I'm saying, okay, here's the next steps. And they do it. That's how I know that there was a real reason. Big okay. difference. So like a legitimate excuse versus a, just a made up phantom. Yeah. Well, I would say not even use the word legitimate excuse. An excuse, if you remove it, the person still doesn't move. Now a reason, if you remove it, they get moving. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. What are some that, because I think it's really cool to hear someone like you say that you still have excuses. What are some like of, you know, this week that excuses that you're using for different things in your life? Oh, uh, well, ooh, that's a tough one because when I use them, I bury them down deep inside and pretend like they don't exist. Right? <laughs> Is that bad? <laughs> yeah. I, only, I only hear them if I smoke weed. Then I'm like, oh, you bastard. That's where yeah. it was. <laughs> it is deep in there. <laughs> exactly. So I think an excuse I use a lot is <clears throat> I, will, I will count on – well, see, I'm already making the excuse right now. I'll count on others to, d to do things and set things up in a way for me so that I can do what I do. Um, and that's really an excuse so that I don't have to do the things I don't want to do. But, you know what I mean? Like okay. uh, you know, clearing the SD card from you know the cameras and lights or the audio that when I'm doing shows or anything like that and making sure it's charged or something like that. My excuse will be like, all right, I hired someone to do that or – Someone else should be doing that because I I need to be focused on the writing or the content, um, when really, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> I want to go surf or do 
do something fun after yeah. I, after I work. That's yeah. probably that's probably my number one excuse I roll with. I like to I like to make people feel pretty bad about not supporting me. That's how I do it. Okay. Yeah, uh, my wife loves it. This is great. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know it's crazy. We'll be in how, counseling soon. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, it is crazy how easy it is to um, excuses are so insidious. I guess is the right word, and they're very very sneaky, right? Like mm. they. They, they almost like masquerade as something else. Like you said, they do all these things to trick you and think that you're, you're, you know, you're doing it for a different reason. Oh, you know, well, Hey, you probably shouldn't do that because of this. And, and in the end, when it comes down to it, you're like, I'm just, I'm just lying to myself, but it's like this little devil inside that just kind of like a little elf or something that just hops around (laughs) making different, making different reasons and lies as to why you're not doing something or doing something. It's incredible. Yeah, we don't, you know, as human beings, we we don't, if something's off in our world, we don't exist in that. We need to do something to center ourselves, to, to calm ourselves down, to bring ourselves back to a homeostatic mind frame. And often what we do is we make up stories, right? And that's these excuses. And, they, and they're... They, they're more than even sneaky. <clears throat> I mean, they really become blind spots, uh, you know, and geez, you know, somebody can have an excuse and not even and be innocent of it. If I go back to the sniper example, like, why'd you miss the target? And, and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. But I'm like, all right, there's 17 reasons you missed the target. You could be innocent to these excuses, but if I can remove them all and you're still going to miss the target. Uh, it's just part of a, our lying to ourselves. Uh, it's a natural condition. That's why we have to have other people around us. And I don't mean just other people. I mean, other people after life, other people who can hold us accountable in a loving and empowering mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Uh, that's, that's why it's critical. Otherwise we just get stuck Yeah, and definitely. go nowhere because yeah. our excuses are in the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I want to talk, I want to ask you a couple things about like the extreme examples you gave in your book as to like swimming five miles in the ocean. And, uh, you had that time in the snow. Um, can you kind of break down when you've gotten to those points of extreme physical and mental exhaustion, um, like overcoming these intense struggles that I think manifest differently in people's lives? Um, what are, what are like, what are some things that you have used or what have you learned from those absolutely extreme conditions? So first I think it's important to define extreme just cause it gets used so much nowadays and I'd invite everybody to accept the idea that anything that's outside of their norm could be considered extreme. And here's why. Uh, because I do believe the, you know, the quote unquote extreme experiences are critical to changing our behavior and modifying who we are at our core. We can't just talk about it. We actually need to experience things. And <clears throat> people get stuck in the idea that they got to go do a halo jump or um, you know, almost kill themselves on the side of a rock. Although I think everyone should do some halo jump and free fall parachuting because that's actually pretty safe, but they get stuck in that. So just everyone understand that these are seemingly extreme circumstances. Uh, but to me, they're just a little bit outside my comfort level. Uh, and I'm just saying that cause I want everyone to be invited and included to do this in their own lives. Now, when it comes to perseverance, um, there's two ways to look at it. There's kind of the hard ass way to look at it. Um, where we continue with something despite the difficulties or challenges. Uh, And then the other way is we continue with something because of the difficulties and challenges. And I always mess up his name. He wrote a book called Flow. It's Mihai Chikminci (coughs) Hai. And what he would describe to you is like a video game is a perfect example. It's just challenging and just difficult enough where we want to stay in it. We are actually persevering when we are inside of a video game. Uh, so there in his book or, you know, the stuff I teach, I'll talk about this flow channel, which is something's too difficult or too hard. We'll stop. If something's too easy, we'll stop. So it has to be just right. Right. Yeah. That's a great book. He has like a graph in there too, kind of showing like you go too far here, you're going to just quit. If you go too far here, it's not going to be challenging. And then he showed like that little sweet spot kind of, right? You got it. And people, the reason I bring it up is uh, perseverance. One of those, those things I teach. It's a, it's a, it's a tenant. It's a mental part of part of mental toughness. And it's a skill set. It's not something we're born with, especially when you start to understand it and apply it to life. Uh, but if somebody's not getting somewhere that they want to, so many people rely on self-discipline and being a hard ass. And that doesn't, that doesn't ultimately work because you fatigue and you can only do so much of that. You can do it a little bit, but you got to bring in desire and other things. So it just becomes a natural thing for you to do. But 
anyways, where I'm getting at is, you know, if I'm working with a sales guy and he can't make cold calls, you know, like, okay, well, it's too much of a challenge. How can we toggle this thing down? And when I'm telling people, it's okay to move the challenge around so you can take your next step, right? Maybe the gap is too big. If you, if you want to go from zero to making, you know, 500 grand a year and you're only making uh, 120, you might need to do little baby steps to get there and persevere in smaller things. Now, when we talk about this five and a half nautical mile swim, which I think if you do the math is closer to seven and we had wind and current, it was like a six and a half hour, something ridiculous. That's so long. <laughs> ordeal, yeah. <laughs> and people, and the same thing in the snow when I was doing the land navigation thing, and those are like the big perseverance things and that's what the stories we tell. And, you know, when you to have someone come in who's been through a radical experience and talk to your company or yourself, those are the stories we like to hear because they motivate us. They don't yeah. actually teach us perseverance um, because those things are really the results of little tiny pieces of perseverance beforehand. Yes. So yeah. the true perseverance is that. So the, that swim was, you know, if you do, if you ever ran a marathon before you start training, if you've only been running a couple, three miles and you go to run your eight miler or something like that, the idea of running 15 miles three weeks later is like, there's no way it's yeah. insane. Dude, I did, I did a, I did a half Ironman, uh, last or like a year ago actually. And, uh, when I started doing the swimming training, I, I swam literally from one end of the pool to the other. And I was like, Oh, Oh God. <laughs> I signed me and my buddy up for what? Like I'm swimming how far in you know three yeah. months or something? I was dead after I swear to you swimming just across the pool. I was like, there's no way this is going to happen. But three months later, it was no problem because, yeah, you just slowly build up. And uh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I thought of this. Um, there's an infographic I saw online that kind of demonstrates what you're talking about perfectly of a giant iceberg. And I think they were just calling it the iceberg effect. And it showed, you know, it was supposed to be like a successful person or in this case, swimming five miles across the ocean was like the very, very tip of the iceberg, which is all you see. And then they showed underneath the water, all the stuff you don't see behind a successful person behind a five mile swim was like failure, doubt, you know, perseverance, you know, uh, hard work and, and all these things. And then at the very top, it was like what the public sees. And it was this very tiny sliver tip of the iceberg that was like, you know, swam five miles success you know yes it was great yes and that's it's a per that's a perfect uh, visual example and um that's that's what i would like people to become aware of so all of those were little tiny things and the perseverance usually starts you know if someone's like all right i want to be a writer and i'm going to try to write four hours a day like what you need to persevere on is not necessarily that four hours. It's not about hammering it out. It's going to be the little things like your sleep routine, eating, exercising, mm -hmm. it, these little tiny things that add up to a big piece of perseverance, which is your point, the iceberg effect. Yes. Yeah. And cutting out drinking too, man, just personally cutting out, just cutting down on the booze, just skyrockets everything else in your life. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's such a, you know, into my forties. And again, I've, like I was saying, I'm, I go through the same, all the stuff I'm writing and working on with other people. I'm, I lived myself to some extent and yeah, I can remember it was several years ago and I was like, good God, man, I, am I drinking every night? Am I, what, am I having to have a beer or two every night? Do yeah. I, do I'm doing that. <laughs> I mean, it sucks the life right out of you. It does. Um, yeah. And the energy levels. And then, it's you know, it's so crazy. I just saw something online or something. Someone's like, hey, what energy drink do you use? I'm like, gosh, bless America, man. You, the energy drink you use is sleep, a diet, and exercise mm -hmm. and recreation and rest. That's the energy drink. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's crazy. People use that. It's the same thing. It's those excuses, those things that we hide from ourselves. Like, okay, if I'm only sleeping four or five hours a night, and my schedule's full and I'm running around like an idiot all day, I'm doing everything I can. So nobody, to include myself, can hold me accountable for the success I produce because um, I'm hundred, I'm maxed out. Yeah. And it's like, well, nope, maxing out is not how you produce success. It's not, it doesn't work. Yeah. God damn, why does it have to be so complicated? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> Just for a little bit or yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of wrap it up a little bit with the, there's a great quote at the end of your book um, that says that the, the only easy day was yesterday, but tomorrow you can be a better person. Tomorrow you can be a better version of yourself. Um, can you just go in a little detail about the only easy day was yesterday? Kind of what that means, that whole mindset. 
Yeah, there's it has two distinct meanings for me. So for context, the only easy days yesterday is a very famous Navy SEAL saying. <clears throat> um, it's etched inside of the buds, basically on a water demolition slash SEAL training uh, in Coronado, where we do all of our training. And what it means to them at that time as a SEAL um, is that uh, you earn your trident every day. That's the big old gold thing uh, we wear on our chest. And what they're saying is don't rest on your haunches. Don't rest on your accomplishments of your past. Don't, you know what I mean? You never stop training. Uh, you never stop moving forward. And uh, there's a certain machismo to that, like we're talking about. And there's a certain like, boom, fire and like, yeah, we're always at it, um, which is a half of the equation because human bodies are not machines. So we don't run like that. Uh, we're biological. We learn differently. We need to rest and recuperate. Our brains are like little computers that have a different kind of a setup to them. Um, the reason I say all that is to me, it's also had a second meaning where it's been like, I call it paradise from the pain where it, the mindset and the saying has me look at life like it's always going to be progressing. There's always going to be a challenge in front of me. And even if I have myself handled, like we talked about earlier, there's always going to be other people that need help. Mm. So ultra, ultra, ultra marathon for me that lasts for eternity gives me peace because I'm not um, in that victim mentality, we're trying to cure some discomfort or pain. We're trying to get away from the anxiety or the depression. And the problem is, is we move in a short term mindset and we just try to deal with the, the thing in the moment. And as soon as we feel a little more comfortable because we lied to ourselves or we doused ourselves with a beer or whatever we did, we stop, we let, we stop working on the, the problem and then it comes back around because we're not after anything so this paradise from the pain the other side of it means i am yeah, always going to have this huge vision this huge thing i'm after that's going to move me forward not necessarily drive me it's just going to keep me moving yes. forward at a, at a pace that i can withstand for eternity so there's a certain peace in that <laughs> if that makes any sense it's, yeah it does man and look it, at it both ways yeah and it's it's easy to i know that i sometimes get caught in this mindset i don't know where it came from but where like I'm working towards a, a day where I'm just going to be kicking on the beach and not doing anything. And I'm like, yeah. I, when have I, I, I don't even, I, I don't even want that, but I don't know why <laughs> that's somehow in my subconscious of like, Hey, you're going to finish this workout. And then guess what? You don't have to work out for two weeks, you know, or like, oh, are you going to, you're going to do all this work. You're going to build this. And then, uh, you know, finally you won't have to do anything for two weeks. And then as soon as I get somewhere and I don't do anything for an hour, I'm like, well, I'm fucking bored. I want to go. I want to go contribute or do something, you know, but it's so weird. This like mentality that comes from somewhere. Yeah. Well, you know where it comes from. It, it comes from marketing and again, not, not going conspiracy theory on it. Yeah, it's imprinted yeah. in all of us because that's what they use. So our immediate discomfort can be solved by a picture of a chick on the beach and some beers and some white sand. And we're like, Oh, I feel better right now by looking at that thing. Mm. My medicine, there's my medicine to treat yeah. the symptoms, not the disease. And I know it doesn't treat the disease because when I go to the beach, I come back. Yeah, that felt good, but I'm not done. I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. You don't. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's, you get there for two hours and you're on the beach. What, yeah. Everyone tells you what, what you want and what you should. That's where you're finally going to be able to relax. Finally get some respite. And you do that for an hour and you're like, this is not nearly as cool as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Exactly. And that's that pleasure from the uh, the paradise from the pain. The rest is inside of the journey. It's not at the end of the journey. We aren't, God bless people. Like I, We're not on this planet. The purpose of being on this planet isn't to be able to kick it on the beach or play golf for the remainder of our years. That is not what we're after. That just doesn't, it doesn't compute. That's why it doesn't work when people retire and they get depressed and they come out of, re you know what I mean? A lot of people have to come out of retirement because they didn't make enough money and save enough. <clears throat> That's why people die if they just retire and stop doing something. We're not built for that. Right. Yeah. I believe, um, Victor Frankl, have you read his book? Um, God, I'm not going to be able to tell <coughs> what this book is called. Uh, it's man's search for meaning. He was, a, he was the concentration camp survivor. No, I don't. I've never read that. I think I've heard the story, though. Okay. Well, anyway, his his main thing in the book, kind of, if I had to sum up the entire book, is the process is the goal. And yeah. Switch, oh, I love it. Switch that mindset. The process is the goal. And you go, oh, 
Oh, so I'm already here. I already made it. That, you know what? I love, gosh, I got it. What was the name of, what was the name of the book? The, the book is called Man's Search for Meaning. That's so fantastic. Cause that's, um, I, you know, I think one of the things I spent a lot of time, the reason why I felt ready to launch that group is it took you, you know, you get yourself in a situation in life where you're like, crap, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm not working out enough. I'm not living my life. I'm not living a good life now. I'm, I've, I've taken on sacrifice that I intended on it being temporary and it moved in permanently <clears throat> because things like family time and fun and recreation and taking care of ourselves, those are what produce the power. They're not, you know what I mean? We need, once we get rid of those things, we're going to get weak and that, that will crush in on us. But I love the whole process is the goal. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to take my meaning from that is my goal Years ago, I figured I I hit that kind of same idea. I'm like, man, I'm not working to retire. That ain't gonna fly. But I am working to produce a situation where my process of what I'm doing in life is a good life. Yeah. So as soon as I heard you say that, uh, that was huge. And I mean, why well, yeah, it was so huge because as I'm working with these guys and bringing on this group and explaining to them what we're doing. That's what I, I mean, at the core, what I'm doing is like, all right, you're in a current process to produce a, to produce a future situation. What we, at the core of our being, we want your process to be your goal. We want you to be in the process of the, what is a good life now and for the rest of your life. So I love that. I love it. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I think that that really, um, almost cures all of the ailments that you talk about through marketing and this, this whole, you know, oh, well, well you know, tomorrow, you know, at, right. Of course, once you get that car, cause once you get the car, you're going to get the girl. But once you get, yeah. the, once you get the girl, then you're going to get this, this house. And you know, once you get these shoes, well, ah, there's new shoes that came out, you know, and this, this chasing around the carrot thing, um, it just doesn't work. So I think that it's a very good, that, that mentality that you're talking about and that Victor wrote about really kind of almost cuts to the core and heals all of that, that we all deal with every day. Yeah, it, it, re it really does. Cause that's uh, by no means am I done in life. But when I hit that, when my, when I, when I hit that process point, like, yes, my day to day life, my, my week, my day, my week, my month, my year is a very good life. Like this is what I've been after. Yeah. It, all that other stuff, it does really go away because it is all so meaningless and it's just, there's no joy. That's what, it's such a great thing. Cause that's where I'm like, no, that's bankrupt. That doesn't work, but you gotta be, that's, this is the other side of that complexity we talked about earlier it's on this side um, that I want to stay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, great. Well, can you tell people where, where to find you, where to you know, get a hold of your books, everything, kind of what you're doing, what you're up to, so they can, they can find you easily? Uh, sure. It's uh, Eric Davis 215. So E R I C D A V I S 215. And it's because there's so many Eric Davises out there. 215 <laughs> was my Bud Seals class number. Oh, bad. So I had a cool. Yeah, I had to put something on it. So now it's been kind of, a, it's become a branding, this 215, whatever. So ericdavis215.com, uh, everything I do hubs from there. I, I work I work just to keep that a single place. Anyone wants to connect with me, go download that ebook, Habits of Heroes, Four Mistakes Men Make and How to Avoid Them. That'll put you on a list that will stay connected. Um, and I'll, you know, for the next year, I'll be talking more about our experiences and sharing that with people. So that's where they can get on board so to speak. Badass, man. Cool. Well, stick around for a second, but dude, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for your service, obviously. And thanks for what you're doing, man. I think it's really, really important and cool what you're putting out there right now. So, so kudos. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. You're welcome, man. Thanks for having me on and sharing this time with me. I appreciate it. Yeah, brother. Okay. All right, cool, man. Well, shoot.